morning, congregation. It's good to be together. I hope we have a blessed service together. I mean, who would have thought in February that we would be gathering this way? I miss worshiping and singing together. I miss playing with the congregation. And I miss our families being together, not being able to hug each other, having to be six or eight feet apart. But let's never forget that whatever happens in the world, that the Lord uses that in his plan for, to fulfill his purposes. Have a blessed Sunday. We hope everyone has a beautiful Sunday. We pray that everyone stays safe and healthy so that we can be together soon. We miss you! We hope you're doing great. Hello everyone, uh, Devin Larato and Atlahang Verhafen here. Hi everyone, hope you guys are doing well. We've been missing you guys so much. We hope you're doing well with your families and we can't wait till this is all over so we can back, get back together soon and have a lovely Sunday. God bless you. Bye bye. And welcome to all of you from us here this morning as we gather in worship. Um, just a reminder, yes, if you want to send in some greeting videos, uh, please do so during the week. We'd love to uh, be able to kind of see each other a little bit as well. Thank you for those who are doing that. And uh, also a welcome to a uh, newbie in our congregation. Pat and Jessica Toomey were blessed with the birth of their first child. Uh, Jack Graham John Toomey was born on Friday, June 5th, weighing 8 pounds, 2 ounces. So we rejoice with them and pray a blessing on them as new parents. And we'll pray for them a little later as well. Our uh, call to worship this morning as we gather comes from Psalm 149. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. While we are in the assembly, as we gather in the name of our Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, together wherever we are, we're in the assembly of the saints that goes around this globe as we worship. The psalmist says, Let Israel, God's people, rejoice in their Maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their King. Let them praise His name with dancing and make music to Him with tambourine and harp. You know, if you're home and worshiping, you can take that literally as well. For the Lord delights in His people. He crowns the humble with salvation. Let's worship the Lord in song. <laughs>
Please stand as we receive God's word of greeting from Ephesians 6. Peace to God's people and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ by the indwelling and presence of his Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen.
from me below. Our hearts so quickly run astray. Temptation crouching at the door to turn us from the narrow way. We look to you. to our song of confession, God's word of assurance in 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This brings us freedom through the blood of Christ. Let's sing.
Because of God's grace and his claim on us, the salvation he gives us unearned in Christ, called to live in his blessing. Jesus spoke and taught as recorded in Matthew chapter 5. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It is our call to live in the blessing of the Lord, and these are the ways that we seek that. We're going to have our children's story at this time. Our, our focus this morning is on racism as part of the beginning of a series um, on the things we've been learning from the Lord. Um, so it, this children's story is a, is a wonderful introduction uh, for us. So please sit down and, and uh, get comfortable. Maybe turn up your volume a little bit on your device. Um, it's being shared with um, Karina and her daughter are reading it. And the daughter's a little quieter than the, than the mom. So to adjust a little bit if you need to. So let's have God's very good idea. Hey, Bethany kids. Today I'm going to read you the story, God's Very Good Idea. In light of the different things that are happening in our world, I thought this would be a good story to share with you. A true story about God's delightfully different family, written by Trillia Newbell. In the beginning, in fact, before the beginning, God had a very good idea. It was an even better idea than the super soaker, solar panels, chocolate chip cookies, color TV, fireworks, the life raft, roller skates, and the x-ray machine. God's idea was to make people, lots of people, lots of different people who would all enjoy loving him and all enjoy loving each other. They would be made in his image. They would be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. Because God is full of love, they will be full of love too. So God got to work. He made a beautiful world for people to live in. Then he made the first people, a man and a woman, and he said to them, Be happy. Enjoy loving me and loving each other. Have a huge family that will fill the earth and look after the earth and enjoy the earth. God carried on creating people. All of them were made in his image, and all of them were different too. Some were men, and some were women. Some liked reading, and some liked riding bikes. Some had darker skin, some had lighter skin. Some had curly hair, and some had straight hair. 
We live in God's world. We are all different, but we are also all the same. Everyone you see is different than you and the same as you. They might look different or speak different or play different, but they are all made in God's image and so they are all valuable. This is God's very good idea, but... People ruin God's very good idea. The first people chose not to love God. This is called sin. And because they chose not to love God as they should, they forgot how to love each other as they should. We are the same. We chose not to love God, and so we are not able to love each other like we should. We sin. Sometimes we treat others badly because they are different than us. People fight with each other. People are mean to each other. People laugh at each other. Because we have ruined God's very good idea, He is not pleased with us. Our sin means we can't be friends with Him or enjoy living with Him. We need God's forgiveness for ruining His very good idea. It's the same for everyone in the world. People who like reading need forgiveness, and people who like riding bikes need forgiveness. People with darker skin need forgiveness, and people with lighter skin need forgiveness. People with curly hair need forgiveness, and people with straight hair need forgiveness. But God was not surprised by people ruining things. He had always had a very good plan to rescue his very good idea. So God got to work. He came to earth as a person, Jesus. Jesus loved people who were different than him. He loved people who no one else loved. He always enjoyed loving all the different people he had met. Jesus shows us how to enjoy loving each other. But people didn't love Jesus. Instead, they hated him. They put him on a cross to die. But this was part of God's plan. On the cross, Jesus took our sins so that we can be forgiven. Jesus forgave his people for their sins. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose back to life and then went back to live in heaven. And then he gave his people his spirit to help them enjoy loving him and loving all the different people they know. Jesus helps us to love each other. One day, God will finish his very good idea. Jesus will come back and make the whole world perfect again, and anyone who has asked Jesus to forgive them will live there with their different languages and skin colors. They will enjoy loving God and loving each other. They will enjoy praising God for making, rescuing, and finishing his very good idea. But here's a very, very, very good part of God's very good idea. You don't have to wait till then to enjoy it. Jesus welcomes anyone who asks him to forgive them. And when Jesus welcomes someone, he welcomes them into his family forever. He welcomes people who like riding bikes and people who like, wait, who like reading. He welcomes people with darker skin and people with lighter skin. He welcomes people with curly hair and people with straight hair. God's family is called the church. Your church friends are your brothers and sisters, your wonderful and colorful church family. You can enjoy loving them and loving God with them. This is God's very good idea. Lots of different people enjoy people enjoying loving him and loving each other. God made it. People ruined it. He rescued it. He will finish it. And with your church family, you can enjoy being part of it right now. We're going to sing our children's song following that as well. So where you are, if you want to stand, we'll do the motions. He's got the whole world in his hand. Let's sing that together.
seated where you are. Our offering for today is for the ministries here in Bethany and the Christian Reformed Church we're a part of, and the second offering is for Resonate Global Ministries, or Resonate Global Mission, and uh, we give together in gladness to the spread of the gospel locally here in this region and around the world, so we're grateful for that. So let's, let's offer our gifts in prayer this morning. Lord, since you have claimed this whole world, you created it, and yes, humanity wrecked it, you redeemed it, <coughs> redeemed it, and you will bring it back completely to where you intend it. And so, Lord, in the meantime, you call us to announce that good news of what you are doing, the good work you are doing. And so we thank you, Lord, for the ministry that we are called to here in Bethany. We thank you also, Lord, for the ministry we're a part of in the Christian Reformed Church with Resonate Global Missions, Lord. We pray that in all their work as well, especially, Lord, in this time throughout the globe with so much crisis going on, that they may be able and have opportunity to continue to share the good news. And we do thank you for the new ways that you are opening up for them, even because of the pandemic and because of the unrest in this world. As for, Lord, we recognize that this whole world belongs to you. You have it in your hands. So we, we give, Lord, with gratefulness in our hearts, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And a reminder that you can give remotely. See the, uh, the weekly um, communication from the church, and it has instruction. The website also has instruction of how to do that as we continue to carry on ministry, even though we're apart on Sunday morning. We continue in our prayers this morning for the world and God's people. So let's continue in prayer. And Father, we come before you knowing full well that we are a people called to bring goodness, to demonstrate your gospel grace and peace in this world. And, and Lord, this last couple of weeks especially, we've watched the unrest and pain expressed around the death of Floyd George in Minnesota, Lord, and we've, we've watched uh, the country south of the border and then within our own country, Lord, we watch protests arise. And Lord, we, we gather together as people to pray to pray for healing and reconciliation in so many hurting communities, Lord. And we, we pray that uh, leaders in those communities and the leaders in the larger uh, areas and the countries, Lord, may, may respond faithfully, may work for justice and compassion, may work for uh, safe and thriving communities, Lord. They work against racism, which so continues to plague this world, Lord. It's, it's not just in the United States. It's not just here in Canada, Lord, it's, it's around the world. We recognize it as part of our sinfulness. And so we ask, Lord, for forgiveness and we ask for your grace and your power of your spirit to pay attention and to learn new things and to be able to respond well and rightly, Lord. We, we seek your strength and wisdom and you give graciously to all who ask. And so, Lord, we are asking. And we ask, Lord, too, that in this time and space there is so much misinformation that goes around and there are theories of what's going on and responses and and lord some of them are very attractive to us it it helps us lord to respond to our own frustrations with it but lord we we pray that you remind us that even though in our culture we call it misinformation you know it lord is lying and not speaking the truth and we're we're called by you lord to speak the truth in love so help us lord to do so help us to um, be diligent and also lord to be silent when we need to help us to be listeners to those around us and what's going on in our communities. And Lord, we're grateful that we can be a part of the work of your, your, your gospel in this world. We, we thank you, Lord, for our continued partnership with Hands at Work and for Morgan Glasberg in there. Lord, we pray that you continue to watch over her and the team. We pray, Lord, that there too they may continue to be able to move and expand um, back towards what they were doing before and that, Lord, in these things too, lives may be served and protected. We pray, Lord, for protection for the vulnerable around the world at this time. For, Lord, so often when the economies do poorly, the poorest of the poor um, don't just lose jobs, they lose their lives. And so, Lord, we pray for the food needs in this world. We pray for a global response, not just in closing down, but also, Lord, in opening up and caring for those who are in dire straits right now. For, Lord, you are the God who provides all. You are the God who has given us what we need day by day. And if we are doing well and being okay right now, Lord, we, have, we owe you that. And so we give you thanks. 
Lord, we pray for those in our communities who are wrestling with, with mental health issues without the supports and the, the rhythms around them, Lord, that help them cope day by day. May you graciously come alongside them and help them, Lord, also to reach out to those who can help. And Lord, will you help us as your people in these communities to keep them before you in prayer, but also, Lord, before ourselves and our hearts that we may continue to reach out and, and find ways to serve those that you lay before us as our, as our neighbors. We want to praise you, Lord, for the gifts that you give us. We rejoice with Pat and Jessica in the gift of a new baby. Lord, bless little Jack and these parents, and we rejoice with them and the grandparents and family. And Lord, though they can't uh, really gather in the way they probably would uh, to celebrate this, our hearts are glad. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, you will watch over them and give them your grace. And Lord, for people in our lives who are continuing to go through struggles, we think of uh, Rachel and Sonia's mother, Linda, and Karen's mother, Jenny, and others, Lord, who are going through these journeys of uh, treatments or healing or just uh, slow difficulties and, and being apart. We think of our seniors, Lord, many of them who are apart right now, and some are, are quite alone and, and being uh, shut in in the, in the homes and the care places they're in. We pray, Lord, for your grace there as well. We pray for encouragement for them day by day. We pray especially, Lord, for your gracious um, strength to uphold those who care for them. Uh, many in some of these contexts, Lord, are feeling entirely overwhelmed. May you, may you give them your mercy and, and uphold them day by day as, as we are relying on them to care for our loved ones. And so, Lord, we're grateful for them and the gifts you've given them. We want to pray also, Lord, for Joanne and as she continues to undergo treatments, Lord, as she continues to wrestle with uh, more difficult news, Lord, about her upcoming surgery. We pray that you give her peace and courage, that you'll uphold her. And uh, Lord, in this journey as well, even if it's difficult and results in, in changes in her life, that Lord, um, you may grant her healing in this. And uh, Lord, as they continue to seek your, your grace in this, will you surround them all? And Lord, we pray for comfort for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We think of uh, a number of people in our own community here in Bethany, but also, Lord, in the larger community, where people, Lord, when we read statistics of those who have died from COVID-19, Lord, um, with each statistic is a grieving family. And Lord, we pray that you surround them with your grace and that uh, you might pray, place in their presence people of, of your grace near, nearby, especially, Lord, if they don't know you, that they may experience your love through them. We pray also, Lord, for the farmers in this area, the number of them, Lord, hit with COVID outbreaks among our migrant worker neighbors. And Lord, we pray for your mercy there as well, for protection and healing for them. And Lord, for comfort for the families of the two who have lost their lives, Lord, or families back in Mexico, Lord, we pray that as they deal with this tragedy, that their hearts too may be, may be filled with your grace and your mercy. That Lord, that they may grieve with the hope that you give. And Lord, may you give the, the farming communities, Lord, your graciousness and will you surround them. We pray, Lord, for these neighbors of ours, the, the migrant workers who are here for uh, good chunks of the year, Lord, and may we continue to, to uphold them and in, encourage them and, Lord, find ways where we can continue to be a welcoming community to them. In all these things, Lord, we seek your wisdom. We look for your will and our, your, your training in our lives to be your people and so, Lord, also as we turn to your word this morning, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that you will work the ministry of grace through the preaching as well, and that we may hear with ears that are ready to hear what you have to say to your people, so that we might be ambassadors in this world to give glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have two passages we're going to look at this morning. The first one is from Leviticus 19. Verses 33 to 44. Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, starting at verse 33. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. And then turning in the New Testament to 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, verse 9 to 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. 
Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is the word of the Lord. We begin a sermon series today under the umbrella theme of what the Lord may be showing us during this COVID-19 pandemic. Now recently I did read an article that cautioned us as Christians and as pastors about looking for reasons for the pandemic, as if somehow we are hearing a new revelation from God today that has not been heard before. Because God's ways, apart from His self-revelation centered in Christ in the Scriptures, Uh, remain beyond us. Romans 11 verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. Yet this same article that I read did venture to highlight things that we are able to discern in today's global health crisis that are rooted in the Scriptures. So for the next number of weeks, Lord willing... We will touch on some of these things, things the Lord may be showing us in our context today, truths that, we, that God that points us to in His Word that reflect on to what we're facing today in the many contexts that we live in, the changes especially. So this morning when I had planned out this, this, um, to do this series, I had thought about it a number of weeks ago, but this morning um, is actually a, a move I wasn't going to do this sermon right away, but we're going to talk about racism and for some obvious reasons. And we're going to touch on racism. We're going to touch on it because we cannot in one sermon or in one conversation or in one Bible passage study come to some final complete understanding of racism and be done with that. Now as COVID-19 began its spread around the globe, immediately so did racist attacks on people of Chinese ethnicity. You may have read some about it. You may also have witnessed that. Whenever there is trouble, there is always a search for someone to blame. And unfortunately, our our connected, globally, social media connected world tends to put those things out there for everyone to read, looking for someone to blame. And so people called the COVID-19 coronavirus, they called it the Chinese flu or the Chinese disease and treated And people in in Canada, in Chinese neighborhoods, were treated with more coldness and fear. And people in our larger cities that perhaps have more people from China living there, um, those people began to experience a change in how they were treated. And people literally avoided, in North America, Chinese restaurants because the disease was first identified in Wuhan, China, and so it was thought to be a Chinese disease. This is a racist response. And then as we saw racism rise with the pandemic spread, so we hear the call from the Lord not to give in or participate in this sin. And then two weeks ago, now unless you have been totally ignoring any news these past two weeks, you will know that of the death of George Floyd while being restrained by police in Minnesota. And you will know that for the past couple of weeks there have been major protest marches all across the U.S., in some places in Canada and in other countries in the world, protests against unlawful police violence and more broadly against racism that continues to plague our North American society. Now the videos being posted from George's arrest and onward through the weeks, they're deeply troubling. They're grief-causing. They are chaotic and disturbing. And if if you are living in, in, in this area, our smaller, mostly white Pelham communities, they seem a bit foreign and strange to us. I believe if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have had some thoughts of, well, I'm glad I'm not like that, not racist like that, or I'm glad we don't have racism around here. And as we've heard again these days of persistence of systemic racism, meaning racism that is built into the structures of society. 
Now, there are all kinds of opinions and research on this reality. We might disagree between us on these things, and I'm not going to be arguing for any particular view on racism or response to it. But I do think there are a few things we need to consider as we watch protesters in news reports and the ensuing responses of all kinds from leadership, both local, from rank-and-file people online and at the, at the country levels. And one thing we need to pay attention to and consider is that racism exists because we are all, by nature, sinful human beings. Racism is a part and the result of the fall into sin. Our rebellion against God, started by Adam and Eve in Eden, and in which we are born into and participate all our lives. And so by virtue of living in the society that we live in, we are participating in broken, sin-permeated systems and structures of society. Political, economic, social, educational, and on and on. And all of this has, as every one of us has, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need to pay attention to that. We participate by virtue of our sinfulness alone. And then secondly, racism is tied to history. Personal racist attitudes are often learned in family contexts where people of one ethnicity dislike, fear, criticize, and even hate people of other ethnicities. And the family story may have had some sad reason for this based in their history, some experience or interaction that became the basis of a blanket view of all that ethnicity or race. But it easily gets passed on from generation to generation if it's not addressed. It gets passed on in how we avoid or disparage or simply treat differently persons who are not visibly like us. Racism is tied to history. And systemically, it is also tied to our history, our collective history. We have heard these past weeks repeated reminders of how our national histories have given rise to the structures that we live in today and how there is racism carried out in these structures. Now, I think for a lot of Canadians, we have initially thought, yeah, that's the United States for sure. But let me give you one Canadian example, and there are many more than one. Because of our history, because of the history of the conquering of indigenous peoples in Canada by European colonialist expansion, we have today third world conditions in some of our communities in Canada. And here is a reason, one of the reasons why. Since Canada as a country decided way back that indigenous peoples of Canada needed white people to take care of them, to help them assimilate into the way of life of the colonizers in an attempt to wipe out their ethnicity because that was the stated purpose at the time, they were all put under the care of the federal government. And as we all should know from our own Canadian history, over the few centuries past, indigenous lands and resources that belong to them have been systematically taken out of indigenous hands whenever something of value was found on them. And these peoples whose land it was were subsequently moved off such lands to smaller and smaller areas of more and more remote parts of our country. But the federal government in Canada realized education is needed for all, and so the federal government has paid for the schools for, such, um, for the people who live on these First Nations reserves. This is all a result of the Indian Act in Canada that has governed the treatment of indigenous peoples since 1876, and it gives our federal government control over most aspects of life on these reserves, which non-indigenous peoples would never accept. Now, one systemic result of this has been that schools on reserves in Canada receive, on average, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent less funding for the public education in the schools than any other public education in Canada. Because of all the other schools are owned provincially, and the federal government takes care of the First Nations reserves. 20 to 40 percent less funding. 
Now, this glaring injustice is based solely on race. If your community is a First Nations community, you get less funding per student for public education than if you're not a First Nations community. And the same goes for child welfare funding. The Canada Human Rights Tribunal, whether you agree with human rights tribunals or not, you need to recognize that they rule that the federal government is discriminatory in its support and practice of providing child welfare resources um, and funding in indigenous communities in part because they do not fund them to the same level as non-indigenous communities are funded. Did you know that our federal government is countersuing, using our tax dollars, countersuing, saying that you shouldn't be comparing federal and provincial funding and that they aren't violating anyone's rights? And yet the result is that many of our indigenous communities in Canada are living in third world poverty conditions, unacceptable. And they have been throughout our history as a country been put into those places and conditions by our Canadian federal government and our, our citizenship as we have done so through the Indian Act. Racism is present in our society, in our country, and for each and every one of us in our sinful hearts that are in need of God's grace and transformation. And though the Bible itself has been used many times and still is at times today used by some Christian leaders to defend ethnic separateness or nationalism along ethnic lines and has even been used to defend slavery in the past, we need to be clear that scriptures do not teach us to be racist in any way. Now, our children's story showed us a wonderful picture, the broad stroke picture of what God's intention is, especially when you see the start of creation and you see the consummation in the book of Revelation. The picture of the fullness of the kingdom of God we see at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation is one of a redeemed people from all tribes and languages and cultures. It's a picture of the foretaste of the kingdom of God to be found in the church today is also one where all nations hear the wonders of God in their own language and respond to God by joining the one body of Christ made up of believers in Jesus all across the globe and throughout time. And that's what Pentecost began. In fact, in the book of Acts, one of the first major internal church struggles is the issue around race. It's the issue of having to be Jewish in order to be Christian. Yes, tied in there is Old Testament theology and, as well, but it, it really viscerally meant for Jewish Christians a reaction against non-Jewish Gentiles. The question was, could Gentiles also be Christian without having to be assimilated into being and living and being a part of the ethnic Jewishness of the day? And the answer was, as the Lord gave that vision to Peter, the answer was that all people in Christ are clean, are acceptable to God, regardless of the color of their skin or the accent on their lips. And if they are acceptable to God, and the early church got to this point, then they are to be acceptable to His people. And then we find this morning that already back in ancient Israel times, Israel's time, this was also already the case. The passage we read from Leviticus 19, it's part of a chapter in a book of the Bible that is filled with laws of Israel of how they are to live with God in their presence. I'd encourage you to read all of chapter 19 today. We find there very specific laws that guide Israel and how to be in, but not of the world around that. And, and in the midst of these laws, we find all kinds of variety. We find both the, the head-scratcher instructions about not cutting the edges of your beard in verse 27, and also familiar foundational language of love your neighbor in verse 18. Some of the laws are tied to the worship ceremonies of the tabernacle and later temple, some to the social norms in the context of the pagan nations around Israel. Some seem very specific to Israel at the time. Some you could read and say, yeah, that still applies today. But even 
taken in context of the Lord teaching his newly rescued people, the Israelites, how to live faithfully before him in the context of pagan nations and their gods around them, even if you just say it's all part of that context, it is striking that in the verses that we read, we find an incredible openness to those of other ethnicity in their midst. Verse 34, The alien, which is the stranger, the foreigner, living with you, must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord, the covenant name of God, the God in relationship. I am the Lord your God. Even though Israel could very well have tried to justify exclusion of persons from other nations, even when they come in their own society, they could try to justify that by virtue of the fact that the Lord took them as the nation for himself, yet the Lord places in the midst of this ancient world a world where nationalism was no stranger, a world where nation constantly rose up against nation to rule them and, and to wipe them out and take them away, that God places in the midst of the, a violent world around them a foretaste of his kingdom. And in the kingdom of God, the foreigner is welcomed as you would one of your own. You might say, well, that was just for Israel in the Old Testament. But really, that should not have been for Israel, who were so clearly instructed to stay apart from the other nations, both their gods, their religions, and even in their marriages. They were not to inter intermarry with the, with the nations around them. They were to keep themselves separate. And the reason for that was devotion to the Lord, to the God before whom there are no other gods. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord above all, no other gods before him. Therefore, keep apart from the gods of the nations, and yet also love people from these nations as yourself, even the foreigner. So it started already in the Old Testament where Israel was being taught how to be separate unto the Lord that there is this welcoming opening to the nations. Then Jesus highlighted this in the, in the, as the foundation of all the scriptural testimony to obedience to God when he said, what's the summary of all the commandments? Love God above all. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God above all and neighbor as self. There is no room, place, any way that racism is in this command, is allowed in this command. If racism is about placing your ethnicity above another person or people, then you cannot do that and love them as yourself because you are loving yourself more than them already. And racism has also had the bitter flavoring of hate within it. And so in keeping with Levitical instruction within God's kingdom ways, we read from 1 John 2, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Racism is a way of darkness, not light. And we, as fallen humanity all, we are to always work to identify and resist the ways of darkness that we discover in ourselves, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our societies, in our countries and in our churches. John was writing this passage to the church. So we need to realize we are not exempt from hating others, not exempt from being racist just by simply being part of a church. So what is our path out of this darkness into the light of loving God and neighbor as self? Well, it is through the gospel of grace in Christ found by repentance of sin and acceptance of God's forgiveness and openness to his transforming work in our hearts and our minds, in our lives, and in our relationships. 
As we read earlier, as God's word of assurance from 1 John 1 verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, racism is darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in racism, part of darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and yet willingly participate in racism in any of its forms, it is all darkness. We are liars and hypocrites. And the sad thing is many people experience the church in North America in precisely those terms. But if we walk in the light God gives by his word and spirit, the result is, as John writes, the result is we have fellowship with, and notice he doesn't say fellowship with God here, but he says we have fellowship with one another. You see, the opposite of racism, with, which wickedly divides, is reconciliation, unity, and fellowship with one another. It's not just tolerance of. It is fellowship with. As racism is highlighted more and more today, so our godly response of loving our neighbor of any ethnicity also needs to be raised to a higher level in response. Because if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another as the blood of Jesus purifies us needs to be raised to a higher level. That's going to take humility on our part as mostly white Canadians in this area. We need to show love, love of neighbor, as we would for ourselves and those close to us. How do we do this? Do we do it by minimizing the pain of others just because we don't feel it? Do we downplay the effects of the pandemic on others if we have not been deeply affected ourselves? Well, no. We do that by humbling ourselves and listening to the suffering of others. We listen to the experience of those who suffer racism in many forms daily all because of the color of their skin. And we listen and learn so that we can understand our participation in the culture we live in and how we might take a step out of darkness into his marvelous light, personally, communally, and culturally as a society. It is done by repentance and reconciliation. That is the work of grace that Jesus died for so that our sins are forgiven and that as we continually come before the Lord to repent. He continually renews us and changes us to be more like Christ. And so demonstrate and show the kingdom values of life of all kinds in this world. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful that you did not wait until we straightened out our lives before you came in Christ to set us free from our sin. And Lord, as you have set us free from our sin, its guilt, you have taken it away. You've also broken the power of the evil one over us. And so, Lord, of all the people in this world, your followers, the members of your church, are ones who can stand up to what is evil and not be overcome by it. But Lord, we know our own history and the history of the church as well. And Lord, we confess that we have participated in racism in many different ways, and it maybe it was slight on our side, but hurtful and deeply impactful on those on the other side of the conversation or the lack of conversation. And Lord, maybe we think it's not a high priority for us in this area, but we pray, Lord, that we are, you remind us that we are part of the global response to racism as your church. And so, Lord, help us to take the time to learn and to listen to be discerning, Lord, of what we read online and to continue to keep those who are victimized before us, that we may respond with wisdom, with truth in love, and that, Lord, we may continue to look to you and humble ourselves before our neighbors, especially, Lord, as we 
may have neighbors from other parts of the world, and Lord, we may not have ever interacted with them, or perhaps, Lord, we are maybe even not happy they have moved in, but Lord, will you change our hearts and help us to realize that this whole world is yours, that you create all people, and you would love all people to come and know you in Christ, and Lord, we are the ambassadors you've placed here. And so, Lord, we ask that you continue to lead us as a community to be gracious and welcoming, to welcome the stranger as we would welcome anyone even in our own family. And that all of this, Lord, may be to your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand if you're able, and we'll sing together the servant song. God's word of blessing is from 2 Thessalonians 2. Lift your hearts before the Lord. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word by the power of his Holy Spirit. God's people say, Amen.
我的